Welcome back to another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic, where I try and solve your bike-related problems, questions, and queries. So if you've got one, make sure you leave it for me down there in the comments section below, or alternatively, on all forms of social media using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And with no further ado, let's crack on the first question this week, and it comes in from Lalorm Work, who says, Hi John, is one bottle cage and bottle better for aerodynamics versus having two bottle cages and bottles on a road bike? Right, totally depends on the bike and the cages, but our friends at AeroCoach actually did some testing on this. And apparently, by having a 500 milliliter water bottle on your seat tube as opposed to your down tube is about 1.4 watts quicker. Now, I can't say that it's gonna be quicker on your bike, so I don't know exactly which bike you've got. And like I've already said, you do need to take into account different bikes, different bottles. They are gonna work differently when it comes to aerodynamics, but it's certainly food for thought out there. Uh, and incidentally, AeroCoach did contact me over the weekend, and they've got an interesting little project for me to go and check out, really, in terms of aerodynamics and how far they've come in the last 20 years or so. But yeah, certainly, Time trial riders back in the mid 2000s, they were putting on empty uh, water bottles on their seat tubes because it was marginally more aerodynamic. So give it a go, see if you can get yourself a PB. Next up, we've got Colin English who says, do the teams all prepare a yellow jersey, polka dot jersey, etc., with the right logos on for the Tour de France in case one of their riders wins a jersey? I know during the presentation, the jerseys are printed after the stage, but I was wondering about the jerseys worn during racing. Uh, right, so those jerseys that the riders wear during racing, the teams themselves don't actually produce any. Although back in 2012, I believe it was what was then Team Sky, they had their own versions made uh, because they thought they were quicker than the standard Le Coq Sportif, who were the sponsor of the leader classification jerseys at the Tour de France. Uh, they were only actually offering kit in small, medium and large, I think, or probably extra small all the way up to large. But of course, riders had custom fitted kits. But these days, Le Coq Sportif, they seem to have really upped their game. And I did in fact see some media photos during the Tour de France, where before a time trial, I think it was Alaphilippe and someone else was in, uh, in a, like a hotel room, I guess, with a load of staff from Le Coq Sportif. And they were actually drawing on the kit that they were testing to actually be able to adapt it and have it ready for them. Presumably as well, they take some sort of printer with them so they can easily sublimate the printing onto the clothing so they can use them the next day uh, because there is a huge amount of accessories that go with it too. So not only is it a jersey, the shorts, generally the team probably have those tucked away somewhere in their team truck. They don't really let them be seen to any of the riders in case it's bad luck. Same goes for helmets, shoes, socks, gloves, shorts. Um, but yeah, those things, so you've also got different gilets, you've got uh, jackets, long sleeve, short sleeve jerseys, all of those things, they will be provided by Le Coq Sportif and be almost personally tailored for the classement leaders. Next up is Kieran or Kyron D. Uh, now they replaced the Tiagra press fit bottom bracket with a Durace one as it was the only version in stock and all the dimensions were the same. However, when they went to reassemble the bike, the crank spindle was extremely tight fitting and took a lot more force to get it in than with the old bottom bracket. Would it being so tight cause any issues? Thanks in advance. Right then, those uh, inner bearing uh, surfaces, they are like an interference fit with your crank in order to actually rotate on them effectively. Generally, your crank actually attaches onto a plastic cover which goes over the bearings, which are then attached onto the bearings in turn. Uh, you won't be the first person out there to have to possibly just tap the uh, right hand crank or right, right arm crank rather into the uh, bottom bracket entry with a little smidgen of grease perhaps as well just to make sure it goes in there okay. It's not going to do any harm, I've had to do it on plenty of bikes over the years uh, and well yeah you're good to go really with that, don't worry about it whatsoever. Of course. If it really doesn't go in, then you need to probably go and get that checked out. But generally they are an interference fit, so everything should be okay. Right, next up is Jens Wirth, who says, I'm installing a new Shimano R7000 rear derailleur, and I'm having problems with chain slack when it's in the smallest cogs. I believe my chain is the right length. What else could I do? Right, Jens, um, basically make sure your chain is the correct length. So when you've got it on the big chain ring and the biggest sprocket at the rear, 
you want the uh, derailleur arm, so the sort of lower arm of it, actually to be quite extended forward, but not too much. I have seen people in the past actually tight, uh, sorry, shorten the chain too much, meaning that it jams when it goes into that sprocket or that combination of sprocket and chain ring. When you try and click a gear lever, it just doesn't move because there's just no freedom in it whatsoever. So you wanna make sure it's not as tight as that, but your problem, like you say, is too long. Is it when you're in, say, a 34 at the front, if you've got a, you know, a compact chain set and an 11, not really a gear you should be in. And quite often the chain there is in its most relaxed position, meaning that it does have quite a bit of sag in it. Uh, but yeah, first of all, I've checked what I've previously said about big and big and make sure that the chain there, well, rather the ridge railer is quite extended forward, but not too much, like I've already said. And then if it is not that extended forward, maybe take a couple of links out and then, well, see if it's okay from there on. Right, now we've got Yaya Bali who says, I want to change my cassette from an 1128 to an 1132 because I'm riding a lot of hills. Uh, I'm wondering, can I mix and match the gear ratios? I want to use the three easiest gears from an 11 to 32 and keep the other gears as I already have. This way I can keep the smaller spacing on the harder gears. Would it work and would I have a huge shifting issue? Yeah, that will work absolutely fine. When I go snooping around pro riders bikes before mounting stages, you quite often see that being done. So they've got, you know, those close ratios down at the harder end of the cassette. And then the easier one, they've got like a bailout gear, if you like, it's like a 32. It will work absolutely fine. Obviously the bigger a gap between a sprocket, so the more uh, teeth difference, the less sort of punchy or snappy that gear change is going to be but it will be absolutely fine so you can do that it's just something to bear in mind the other thing to bear in mind there is to make sure your rear derailleur can actually accommodate a 32 tooth cassette um, so that's something which could easily be rectified with something like a wolf tooth derailleur extender so a derailleur hanger extender it's just a simple bolt on bit of kit just drops it down a little bit and then you can use a 32 no problem Right, Juan Galazza is next. Uh, are tubular wheels safe for racing and everyday training? Yeah, totally safe. Something to consider though, is if you're out training with a tubular wheel, you are gonna need to generally take a spare tubular tire with you because if you were to get a cut in the sidewall or even the tread nicely cut up, even a tube of that sealant which you can just chuck in there and it's sort of self-inflating, that won't do the job because it's just gonna be too big. Uh, also, consider that if you're using tubular wheels for racing, generally for training, when I used to train on tubs, you would use a tub wheel that would have a heavier duty tubular tire on it, purely to get more miles out of it, because of course a lightweight racing tubular is lightweight in the carcass of it and the tread of it tends to be a little bit softer, so it wears out quicker there too. Um, you don't actually see that many people these days training with tubular tires, even in the pro ranks. Occasionally you see a rider go out on a rest day and they'll have a spare tubular stuffed into a cut off water bottle, but not that many, because well, clincher tires have really improved these days. Right, penultimate question now comes in from Paul Bertram, who says, I have hydraulic Shimano 105 brakes and discs. Size for size, can I easily upgrade the discs to Altegra or Dura Ace without any other changes? Yep, no problem whatsoever. Uh, now, when you change them over, just make sure you push the brake pads back in. So just get yourself a tire lever or something blunt, basically, to just push them back into the calipers just to reset those pistons, meaning that that new uh, rotor can be set up correctly. So give the brake lever a few pumps because they're self-adjusting those brake pads and then they'll start working okay. But before you head out on your first ride and start hurtling down some descents or sharp corners or anything, go up and down the road probably 10 or 15 times, probably up to about 15 miles an hour, and then pull the brakes pretty hard. Not so hard that you go over the bars or skid or anything like that, but enough to bring you to a pretty sudden halt. That way you're going to bed in the pads with the disc rotors. Uh, now a lot of people out there will say to you, if you're going to put on some new rotors, also replace the pads at the same time. So that could be something to consider there because of cross-contamination and all sorts of problems you get like that. Uh, something also worth thinking about too is make sure, of course, that they use the same fitting type. So in your case, it's almost certainly going to be center lock rotors. But yeah, absolutely fine to go ahead and do that. Right, final question this week comes in from Cesar Z. Lou, who says, how do I keep the cables from rubbing on the paint of my bike? Oh yeah, unsightly paint scratches from cables, nothing worse. Right, okay, a couple of options here. The first one is to get yourself some clear tape. It's called helicopter tape or frame protector tape, something like that. 
you can actually cut it into shape and size and then apply it over the patches of the frame where the cables are rubbing. However, the downside of that, I don't think they look that good really. And they quite often begin to peel back when dirt or water gets underneath them because you have to apply them very carefully. Uh, make sure that none of the oils or greases that come in your fingers naturally get on the backing side of it because then it's not going to have maximum adhesion. So. A great solution for this instead is to get some uh, spirally bound rubber bits and pieces. You can pick them off on it, pick them up off eBay or from local bike shops, that sort of thing. They just wrap around the cables and that stops the cables from rubbing away. Alternatively, you can get other ones that slide on. They're a bit tight, bit tighter fitting, sorry, uh, but they go on during the insulation process of cables. They look more professional and they look just a lot better really than that plastic tape that you can just stick on. But yeah, those are your options, my friend. Let me know which one you go for. And also remember, if you've got yourself a bike problem, leave it for me down there in the comments section below. I love getting stuck into them and trying my best to help solve them so you can be out on your bike enjoying yourself in no time at all. Now, remember to like and share this video with your friends and also subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to click that notification icon too, the little bell there so you get alerted each and every time we put a video live. Also, don't forget to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. We've got a whole heap of goodies for you to check out. And now for two more great videos, how about clicking just down here and just down here.